Our next speaker is coming from the US. He has, was quite a long way to travel here and he has to go back, unfortunately, very soon. Thank you very much for coming. It will be a pleasure for us. It is Gary Francioni, so I spell the name Italian. I hope this is, is correct, more or less. Thank you very much. He will talk about philosophy of animal rights. Uh, he is in the business of animal rights since many years, published many books. He may have a bit of different view on some of the things than most of the audience here. He holds a bachelor and master degree in philosophy from the universities of Rochester and the University of Virginia. He was working as an editor for a journal, the Virginia Law Review. He was working for private lawyers. He was working for the court before he became professor at the University in Pennsylvania in 1984, where he chaired the law. He was and is guest professor in many universities within the US, but also outside the US, US in Canada and Europe, and he was in Lincoln, UK, where he will start, I guess, within this year. He was the first introducing the topic animal rights in the or into the curriculum at a US university in the field of law. And I think this is, uh, was more and important, is more important than ever. He's also very active. He may mention this in the field and the debate of climate change. So he is interested in the broad, in broad topics from animal rights to environmental impacts to climate. Gary, it's a pleasure to have you here. The stage is yours. When Andrea, okay, put the, okay, the green one. When Andrea, oh my God, these lights. When Andrea asked me to come uh, to speak here, my first response was, do you have the right guy? Um, because I've been a vegan for 40 years and I don't generally get invited to speak to these sorts of events. And I'm glad, I'm glad that I'm able to be here with you and to share some ideas with you. And one thing I want to say is that I will probably say lots of things that you won't agree with. Uh, and I don't mean in any way to insult or provoke you. Um, I'm just going to talk with you about the philosophy of animal rights and what that means. And, um, and I hope we can have a discussion afterwards uh, about things. All right. I'm pressing. I'm pre oh, next. Okay, there we go. All right. The, the basic animal rights position is animals must have, it, have at least one basic pre-legal moral right, the right not to be property. If animals are property, whatever we talk about in terms of our ethical, ethical obligations, they have no moral value. They are property. They only have extrinsic or external value. I'm going to talk a little bit about that as I go on. But that's the animal rights position, that animals cannot be property. They have to have at least the one right not to be property. Now, a right is simply a way of protecting an interest. We all have interests. All sentient beings have interests. They are things that we prefer, that we desire, that we want. Okay, there are different ways of protecting those interests. We can protect them consequentially, that is, we protect them only to the extent that consequences justify that, or we can protect them irrespective of whether consequences militate in favor of their protection. For example, we have a right to engage, we, have, we talk about the right of free speech. What do we mean by that? We mean our interest in expressing ourselves, both as a, as a way of self-actualizing and as a way of contributing to the marketplace of ideas. These interests are protected even if uh, what we say upsets other people or else I wouldn't be here, right? So, so, um, <laughs> and so, so we talk about a right as simply a non-consequential way of protecting an interest. Rights are not absolute. Okay, I have a, a right of freedom, but I could, I, I, I can go where I want. Um, but if I commit a crime and I'm found by a jury of my peers to be guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, my liberty can be taken away from me. So rights aren't absolute. All right, there's a lot of controversy about which rights uh, humans have. We talk about uh, you know, there's a lot of controversy. You know, do we have a right to health care? Do we have a big debate going on in the United States right now? A lot of people think that it is a sign that we are degenerating into communism if we say that people have a right to health care. But people, there's a lot of dispute about whether, you know, what rights people have. But there is no dispute. The one thing that we all agree on is that humans have a right, irrespective of what other rights they may have, and irrespective of whether particular forms of treatment constitute discrimination, all humans have the right 
not to be treated as property. We all reject chattel slavery. Why? Because if you are a chattel slave, you don't count morally. You don't count legally. You are totally outside the legal and moral community. You are a thing. So whatever other rights you might have or what other, what other forms of treatment may or may not constitute discrimination, we all agree that chattel slavery is a bad thing because not being a slave, not being a thing, is the minimal protection you have to have to count morally, be a member of the moral community, be a member of the legal community. Now, we give everybody this right. That's not to say, by the way, that slavery doesn't exist. It does. Nobody defends it, okay? There's sex trafficking going on. It's a big problem. Nobody says, well, you know, that's, it's really okay if we do it humanely, you know, humane sex traffic. Nobody, nobody defends it, okay? Now, um, we give this right, we regard as a fundamental moral proposition that this right is held by everybody who's sentient, who's subjectively aware. It's not contingent on how smart you are, how beautiful you are, how talented you are. It doesn't matter. Everybody is, is, this is a right that everybody who is sentient gets, including people who are severely disabled and have very little cognitive activity going on. Okay? It's a limited, it's limited protection. It only stops use as a resource. Okay? So we don't use people as non-consenting subjects of biomedical experiments, as, as, as uh, or forced organ donors. We, we do reject chattel slavery, etc. So it's, a, it's minimal protection. But what, it's, what it gives you is rights type protection, i.e. non-consequential type protection for your interest in not being used exclusively as a resource. So now the question becomes, do animals have this right? Are we obligated, is there, is there a rational reason not to extend this right to animals? Now we can say, well, you know, there are reasons because animals don't have souls, etc. But I'm not talking about theological or spiritual, I'm talking about ra rational reasons. Are there any rational reasons to not give this right, this one right, not to be a resource to the other sentient beings with whom we share this planet? Is there a rational basis to deny, to, to, to deny according them, this right? Okay, the usual ground is that they lack some cognitive characteristic that we have, that they are cognitively inferior. That's the usual reason that's given. Now, you know, some people say, well, you know, they, they can't, the, the, you know, an example is, um, uh, do I have a, I thought I had, okay, wait a minute. This should be reversed, sorry. Okay, uh, for an example, example, we say, well, rationality and the ability to use concepts. We're rational. We have the ability to think conceptually. They don't. So therefore, it's all right for us to use them as resources. Okay, now, that can't be a justification. Hold on. There we go. That can't be a justification. First of all, I would say as an empirical matter, animals clearly do have, uh, they do act in rational ways. They act in purposive ways. But I would also say that they, have, they must have some equivalent concepts in their head. Our concepts are linked to our linguistic abilities. To, the word, to words, we use symbolic communication. We're the only animal that uses symbolic communication. So our thoughts, our concepts are linked to our language, okay? And, and so I don't know how they think. My partner and I live with five rescued dogs. I have no idea how they think. It is clear to me that they think. They must have some equivalent sorts of concept. They must have some equivalent to conceptual ability. But Whatever defect it is, what, you know, whether they do or don't, there are some humans that are not rational. There are some humans who are unable to think in conceptual terms. Now, does that mean we treat them equally to people who are, quote, normal, end quote? And the answer is no. The differences may be relevant for certain purposes. So if you ask the question, you know, should we give somebody who's severely disabled is not rational and is unable to think conceptually a driver's license, the answer is no, of course not. But if the question is a different question, should we use that human 
as a non-consenting subject in a biomedical experiment? Should we take the organs out of that healthy but severely disabled person and, and, and transplant them into, quote, normal, end quote, people? The answer is no. Should we enslave them? The answer is no. So it depends on the question you're asking. As a matter of fact, I would say that, you know, coming from the United States, I live in a place where we not only do not use people who are irrational and unable to use concepts as resources, we make them president. Okay, now, um, honestly, I was, I, was re I was looking at my phone this morning and reading uh, what he was doing at the G7 conference, and I, I was almost weeping. Anyway, um, similarly, the idea that, you know, there's this idea that, well, we're, you know, animals can't write symphonies, animals can't do calculus. I remember once debating a vivisector um, at a university, and she said, she was trying to put her finger on the differences, and she said, humans write symphonies. And I sort of looked at her and I said, when was the last one you wrote? And, um, and, and we, we got, I mean, bottom line is, is that you can't really sort of say, well, animals, we're, we're sort of cognitively superior. And the answer is, what does that even mean? What does that even mean? You know, I mean, it, th that's, that's such a question begging position to take. Um, and also, there are people who can't write symphonies and can't do calculus, obviously. And there are people who don't have particularly developed aesthetic taste and whatnot. We don't use them as non-consenting subjects of biomedical experiments. It doesn't mean that we, we use them as, as forced organ donors. Um, you know, we, again, the question is not whether animals should have all the same rights that humans have. The question is, should they have the one right that every sentient human has, which is not to be used exclusively as a resource. No one's telling, talking about giving them driver's licenses or allowing them to go to universities or vote, although we might have better results. Um, and no, one, no one is talking about that, all right? Um, now, the, the, the problem with accepting this one right is that it requires the abolition of all institutionalized animal exploitation as a matter of justice and it commits us to veganism. If animals have the right not to be used as property or as commodities, which is what they are, if we say that violates their right not to be used as resources, we can't justify institutional exploitation and we are committed to veganism. Now the usual response is, we don't have to go that far. You know, the usual response I get at this point is, well, wait a minute now, that's a bit extreme. We've got an alternative, and that's the animal welfare theory. Okay, the animal welfare theory that it's all right to use them, that there's nothing morally wrong with using them as long as we don't impose unnecessary suffering on them and we treat them humanely. That's the animal welfare position. Now, I want to make two observations about this. If we think about it, the conventional position, the animal welfare position, which I would say is actually the position most people take when you ask them, what do you think about, you know, about animals and our moral obligations? Well, you know, I don't think they're the same as us, and I think we count more, but I think that it's all right for us to use them as long as we don't impose unnecessary suffering on them and as long as we treat them humanely. Now, what, let's, let's, let's unpack that a little bit. We talk about necessity. If we have a norm that says you shouldn't impose unnecessary suffering on animals, and that's got any meaning whatsoever, okay, it's got to mean we cannot impose suffering on animals for reasons of pleasure, amusement, or convenience. If I say to you, well, you know, I think it's really wrong to impose unnecessary suffering on children, but occasionally I like to torture them because I like to hear them scream, you would say, well, wait a minute now, that's an exception that now basically completely eliminates the rule. So, I mean, I, so, so if the norm, if the moral norm, if the moral norm has any meaning whatsoever, any meaning whatsoever, it means we can't inflict suffering for the reasons of pleasure, amusement, or convenience. I would suggest to you that our, those are the only justifications that we have for 99.99999% of the animal exploitation in which we engage. There is no, it's, eating animals is not needed for health, it's an ecological disaster, and there are issues of human starvation involved. Let's go through those a little bit. There is no doubt that 
there is, this is just one, I just, it was the one slide I, I put in. Um, but every governmental organization and an increasing number of professional organizations are saying, you don't need animal protein, meat, dairy, eggs. You don't need any of that. Obviously, when people, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, it's a vegan diet. And what they mean by that is if you eat iceberg lettuce, will you be okay? And the answer is no. But if you eat strawberry ice cream and steak all the time and nothing else, you won't be okay either. So, and I, I'll, you know, I, I, when I hear people say, well, you know, these parents were prosecuted for feeding their children a vegan diet, and you find out they're just giving their children lettuce, the answer is that's not a vegan diet, that's a stupid diet. It has nothing to do with, I mean, it's just dumb. You shouldn't, I mean, you know, that's not a vegan diet. But no governmental organization maintains that you need to eat animal products to be optimally healthy. As I said, I've been a vegan for almost 40 years now. I ain't dead yet, and I cannot remember the last time uh, I had a cold, and I mean that quite sincerely. I cannot remember, the, I was trying to think last night, when was the last time I was sick? I cannot remember the last time that I had anything wrong. Is, indeed, the empirical evidence is mounting that eating animal products is detrimental to human health. I mean, you're getting insurance companies in the United States now, Kaiser Permanente, which is an enormous insurance company, recommending vegan diets, and they ain't doing that because, you know, they're concerned, I mean, they're doing that for economic reasons, because the health benefits of a sensible economic, of a sensible vegan diet are inestimable. Okay, as far as impact, global impact is concerned, there is no doubt that without a widespread transition in the, in the fairly near future to a vegan diet, fairly widespread transition, we will be unable to avert climate catastrophe. You know, recycling your plastic bags and that sort of stuff, that's great. But the bottom line is, is that animal agriculture is the single most detrimental, single most important factor in global warming. Single most important factor. As a matter of fact, um, I, I met with the, the two fellows who did this study, Joseph Poor and Marco Springman at Oxford. Um, I recently met with them, and their work is absolutely terrific. And Marco, uh, who was discussed in that article in The Guardian, says that basically we, the planet, we've got to move towards a 75 to 90 percent reduction in the eating of all animal products if we want to avert climate catastrophe. I mean, look what's happening right now in the rainforest. That's not happening because, you know, someone had a cigarette and threw the match down. That's happening because they're clear-cutting forests so they can make room for cattle grazing and they can make room to grow crops to feed to cattle. Then there's the issue of human starvation. In the United States alone, we feed enough grain to animals we could feed between seven and eight hundred uh, million people. Okay, that's, a, I mean, we could stop world starvation. Now, the response I get in this is, well, wait a minute, if everybody was a vegan, we'd have more acres under cultivation. No, we have fewer acres under cultivation because it takes between three and 16 pounds of plant protein to produce one pound of flesh. If we were all vegans, we would be using many, many fewer acres. We would be able to feed the world. So even if you don't care about animals, if what you're concerned about is our obligations to each other as human beings, I would suggest that also militates in favor of veganism. If you look at the animal welfare theory that most people accept, as, as the, the sort of the conventional wisdom. Yeah, it's all right to use them as long as you treat them humanely, don't fix unnecessary suffering. The bottom line is you're committed to ruling out everything where there's not a compulsion, a necessity, a dilemma. So yes, I suspect if you have an animal welfare approach and you say, well, if it's between, you know, I'm starving on the desert island and it's either, you know, I eat the rabbit uh, or I starve because there's no plant protein to, to eat, of course, that raises the question about what the rabbit was eating. But, but if, you, if you are in that situation, then you choose to eat the rabbit. I understand that. But we're talking about the, the, whole, the, the, the theory of animal welfare, which actually developed in the 18th century, 19th century, was based on the idea that there was, you know, that, that it was okay to use them when there was a compulsion, when there was a necessity, not when it's a matter of palate pleasure or fashion sense. 
So I would suggest that basically if we accept the animal welfare position, we're still committed to almost the same, the, on, the only real difference between the animal welfare position properly understood and the animal rights position is where you have uses of animals that are not transparently frivolous. For example, vivisection, when you're using animals to cure, uh, you know, important human illnesses. A rights position would rule that out because it would be just as you can't use uh, severely disabled humans um, to, you know, even if it were, you know, to take a severely disabled human and who's healthy, physically healthy, and save 10 other people. That's a fact. We could do that. We don't do that. Why? Because that person's got a right not to be used in that way. Similarly, if you apply the principle of equal consideration, you need to be able, if you're going to use animals, you need to be able to point to a difference. You can't. So the, the animal rights position would be, no, you can't use them for vivis in vivisection. The animal welfare position would be, well, you know, if it's necessary, perhaps, that, you know, if, it's, if you really need to use animals, you need to take the pig valve out of the, 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 uh, the, 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 the pig part out to put into the human valve, you know, to, for a valve operation. Uh, then the welfare per position might permit that, probably would permit that. But that would be the only discussion we would be having if we had a rat, if, if we really took seriously the theory of animal welfare. The only times we would be thinking about using animals is when it is necessary to do so. Okay? Not palate pleasure, not fashion sense, not entertainment. It would be only in those situations where there's a conflict, where there's a clash, where there's a moral dilemma. So we would get with the, with the animal welfare position understood logically, because right now this idea that, that well, we have, we're animal welfare people, we believe that we can use animals as long as we don't impose unnecessary suffering on them, it's incoherent. And why is it incoherent? It's incoherent because animals are property. Go back to the beginning. The animal welfare standard can't work because the, 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 the idea that we shouldn't inflict unnecessary suffering on animals can't work because animals are property. They are things that we own. There was an earlier question that came from the audience before where the person who asked the question said, animals are my property. You take my property, it's like coming into my house. Exactly, they're property. They are things that we own, things that we own. You know, everybody says, well, you know, I've got, I love my dog, I love my cat. My cats aren't things that I own, they, they control me. And the answer is, you may love them, you may think of them as members of your family, and if they become inconvenient, or you don't like them anymore, you have the right to take them to the veterinarian and have them killed. You have the right to take them to a kill shelter where they will be killed if another home is not found. You may love them, you may think that they are members of your family, they are your property, they are things that you own. You may like them a whole lot, you may like your car a whole lot, but your car is a thing that you own. Your dogs and cats and rabbits or whatever non-human companions you have, they are things that you own. Animals are things that we own. They have interests, it costs money to protect their interests. And we generally don't spend that money unless we get some sort of benefit, generally an economic benefit, in, in protecting animals. Animal welfare is linked to this, I, 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 my first book, which was in the, the early 1990s, was Animals, Property, and the Law. And what I wrote about in that book was, if you look at the history of animal welfare, what you see is instances where we protect animal interests because it's economically good for us to do so. Case in point. The Humane Slaughter Act of 1954 in the United States, which requires that large animals be stunned before they're shackled, hoisted, and cut. If you look at the legislative history on that, what you see is, I mean, animals have all sorts of interests, all sorts of interests that we disregard, but at the moment of slaughter, we say they've got to be stunned. Why? Because if you've got a 2,000-pound animal hanging upside down and chained by her back leg, what happens is the pelvis breaks, they go into a lot of pain, they move around a lot, they incur carcass damage, and they, they cause worker injuries. We protect animal welfare because it's economically good for us to do so. Indeed, animal welfare is what a ra every rational property owner would do if they had full information. Okay? One of the interesting things is factory farming started in the 1950s. 
It is only now that we are coming to see some of its inefficiencies. The idea was, well, if I've got 10 animals and I can make $10 profit um, with those 10 animals, I can put 100 animals in the same space and make $100. And the answer is that wasn't factoring in that the stress levels and other things would, would, would create problems and would create inefficiencies. Okay? Um, right now, there's a big movement to have controlled atmospheric killing of poultry. If you look at the, I mean, look at, the, at what even animal, quote, animal rights organizations, uh, and again, I want to be clear, I have nothing to do with those, those organizations, um, but if you look at what these animal organizations are, are putting out, they're arguing that the, the economic studies show that controlled atmosphere killing is the economically wise thing to do. I, I would go so far as to say, if you were, if you were building a chicken processing plant tomorrow, and you didn't use control atmosphere killing, you are, you're irrational. It's a much more economically sound way. You'll save lots of money if you use control atmosphere killing over the conventional way of killing poultry. Why? Because when, when everybody enacted their humane slaughter laws, poultry weren't counted. Poultry, poultry generally, in some countries they were, but most countries they weren't, were not. Why? Because they're small and because you don't have a whole lot of carcass damage or, or you don't think you have a lot of carcass damage. Studies have shown since then that there's a lot of carcass damage with the traditional way of killing poultry. There are lots of worker injuries with the traditional way of killing poultry. So I suspect that what's gonna happen is, is the tax benefits of present poultry processing plants phase out and people have to reinvest capital. They'll reinvest capital in control, some, some form of controlled atmospheric killing. It's a much more rational way of doing things. Okay, much more economically sound way of doing things. Animal welfare, by and large, does nothing more, nothing more than ensure that animals are exploited in an economically efficient way. As a general matter, there are some exceptions, but they're very small exceptions, very, very small exceptions. And, and, and you know, remember, animal welfare requires that we balance the interests of animals against those of humans. Humans, property owners with property rights in animals against property. We're going to balance the rights of human property owners who have rights against animals who have no rights and are the property of the people against whom or, 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 or against whom the interests are being balanced. Who's going to win that? The, if you're going to have an institution of property, the property owner always has to win. So basically, if animal, if, uh, you know, if, if, if the animal welfare theory as it's presently applied, as it's, as it's presently applied, um, animals are still things. They have no moral value. They're things, they're property that we own, that we exploit, okay? They still remain as things. So the idea that the animal welfare position which is a fairly recent position. I mean, it basically started in Britain in the early, you know, the, 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 the end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century, okay? It, it, it's a fairly recent theory, but the idea that most of us go around with, well, that animal welfare gives moral value to animals, the answer is no, it doesn't. The only way that could work, arguably, is if you took the position that, that, the, that it was all right to impose suffering on animals in situations of compulsion or necessity. There isn't compulsion or necessity for 99.9999999% of our uses of animals. Um, I want to end. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Um, okay. Um, you know, it's sort of interesting because I think uh, many people, um, if not in this room, certainly people who are producers, worry about the animal rights movement. The animal rights movement is not, in many ways, never been a pro the problem. Um, if you look at the history of these animal rights groups, and I'm talking about even the ones that are supposedly more extreme, they basically are what I call happy exploitation organizations. What they want to do is they want to get producers of animals to improve animal welfare in fairly negligible ways. I mean, it's no coincidence that that um, the groups like, like PETA and groups like the Humane Society of the United States are promoting controlled atmosphere killing. If you look at their literature, 
If you look at their literature, you see what they're saying is, this is an economic, they've got all sorts of stuff from agricultural economics journals. And saying that it's a much more rational, you'll save money. You will save money as a producer. You'll save money if you go to controlled atmosphere killing. These organizations are by and large, I suspect, I don't know. Um, I used to be involved with them many, many, many years ago, but I'm not anymore. I suspect they probably sit and read agricultural economics journals and they come up with, they, they read the articles in there about practices, agricultural practices that are economically vulnerable. So they read the studies that show that calves in crates have a higher level of stress, they have a higher demand for veterinary care, that cuts down on profit, it's actually much better if you have them in a small social unit, it's much better economically. My guess is that's the sort of stuff they're reading that they, they gear their campaigns off of. They're not in many ways trying to eliminate animal exploitation, I mean they'd go out of business, they would have to get jobs doing something else. Okay, they want, I mean, I, I've been very critical of these groups for many, many years now. Uh, be precisely for this reason, that they promote ha happy exploitation. I also am opposed to the idea that, you know, anybody promotes violence against farmers. Farmers are, 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 are responding to demand. The idea that people are, 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 are threatening farmers in any way or, or, or you know, going in to slaughterhouses, and, I mean, you can, slut you can shut down. I always tell the animal people this, um, and they generally react in a more animated way than you're reacting right now. But when I say to them, um, you know, you shut down 10 slaughterhouses right now, if the demand is the same, you've got 10, 10 new ones open up, opening up tomorrow, or you've got 10 existing ones increasing production capacity. So what the hell are you doing? I mean, the problem isn't the farmer. Farmers, you know, if the demand's for beef, they'll provide beef. If the demand's for bananas, they'll provide bananas. Farmers ain't the problem. Slaughterhouses aren't the problem problem is the demand of the public. So in many ways, I think these animal organizations that have been vexing or perceived to be vexing, in many ways, they're not only not problems for the industry, they actually work in symbiosis with the industry because what they do is they try to identify, my argument is they try to identify inefficiencies that they educate property owners on and they have campaigns focused on these inefficiencies. What is a threat? is the growing number of people who aren't involved with these animal groups at all and who for reasons of morality, reasons of environment, reasons of health, they're just basically saying no. As I, you know, yesterday I was, uh, I met, a, uh, I was having a discussion with a young person I met in, um, in uh, Ghent, near the hotel I was staying at. And this person asked me, why are you a vegan? And I said, well, I could give you an answer that would take like a long time. Or I could like put it to you this way. If I don't have to kill to be healthy, why should I? And I think I left them with something to think about. And I understand that a lot of you have economic interests in animal agriculture. And I understand you probably don't agree with anything I said, but thank you very much for listening. Thank, thank you very much for this very stimulating talk. I guess we all agree on the statement you made about your president. Or, <laughs> so at least this. We have to talk about the other statement. So we have time for one or two questions. Later he will be up on stage. So who has a question up there is one. They have no questions. They're all going to become vegan. Right? Yeah. <laughs> right. OK, good. OK. okay um, Thank you. Um, I think most of us really enjoyed that, but I think you were, we all agree as well. It was like listening to your president, uh, I think a lot of us that we didn't uh, agree with. But I wanted to take you up on a couple of things. First one, uh, a major contradiction that you made about you've, as a vegan, have decided not to use animals as food, but you're quite happy to use animals as companions with your five dogs. So that's a, that's a contradiction. Um, also, uh, a question regarding the fact is that is plant-based agriculture environmentally benign and livestock agriculture not? One of the most damaging products on the planet is palm oil. Huge increase in palm oil because we've had to strip animal fats out of products. So, are you quite happy what, to what's have... The, what's the, because of the P, what's the word? Palm oil. Oh, palm oil. Yeah. 
Um, yes. So, and, and also your question, are you happy as well that, or are you sure that every soya product that you've had in your vegan food has not been a result of deforestation? Um, let me say first about my dogs. Um, I am opposed to domestication. If there were, I love our dogs. And if, but if there were two dogs left on the planet and it were up to me whether they continue to breed so that we could have pets, the answer is no. Um, the five dogs we have, three of them are cruelty cases. One was born uh, after her mother was rescued from a puppy mill, which is an intensive way of producing dogs. And one is a blind and deaf dog um, that nobody wanted and was going to be drowned. Um, I love them, but um, we shouldn't have, uh, so it's not, it's not really a contradiction. They're here. Um, they're, I consider them uh, my non-human refugees. Um, and and uh, someone's got to take care of them. I take care of five of them. And, um, and actually, I've had as many as seven, but we decided um, after five, they really start developing a pack mentality, and they realize they, they outnumber you. Um, but but um, so we, we've kept it to five now. Um, do I, a lot of the crop production that we have, remember something, a lot of the crop production that we have is, um, is so that we can feed those crops to animals. I mean, a lot of these monocrop situations, uh, it's not humans or primarily humans that are consuming those products. It's, it's animals who are consuming those products. Um, point number one. Point number two, as far as palm oil is concerned, everything, you know, um, uh, one of the things that I think is, um, uh, you know, one of the, one of the, one of the, the observations that uh, is made by the Jains, uh, who were referred to earlier in the Father's talk, um, is that all action results in some sort of himsa or violence. And, you know, the reality is when we're, we're planting crops or harvesting crops, are we unintentionally or, uh, uh, you know, are we unintentionally killing animals? And the answer is sure we are. Um, but there's still a difference. Uh, and, and whether it's orangutans with palm oil or whether it's other animals with other sorts of oil, um, obviously we should endeavor to make sure that we, are, uh, we, we do as little harm as possible, absolutely. But there is no such thing as conduct which doesn't cause harm. We build the road. We know at particular speed limits, you know, p if you build the road. You know that at the speed limit of 60 miles an hour, you know, X number of humans w will be killed on that road. Um, it's not what we intend, but it's, an, it's unavoidable from the action of having roads. We still distinguish that from murder. But in any event, we can talk more about that later. These are complicated questions. Thank you. One more question up there. Oh. Um, so I think your heart is in the right place. I'm sorry? I think your heart is in the right place. What you mentioned about uh, not harming animals and being uh, ethical in our treatment to animals, I think we can all agree like not kind of like psychos that want to hurt animals but at the basis of the argument when you say there is no necessity i think that's where there is some work to do i don't know if you're familiar with the the most recent uh, literature on human health but a lot of the the health arguments that have been used against uh, animal foods that are for example rich in saturated fats those have been debunked in the by meta-analysis in the last 10 years and um, the environmental impact aspect also, the estimates that you probably are aware of coming from Marco Springman and that group and all of the Eat Lancet initiative that you may know, uh, all of those need to be revised and there is researchers in the US here in Belgium also, Frederick, uh, Frederick Leroy, um, Frank Bittlener in the US in California, if you, if you care to look for those, yeah, I'm familiar. that have updated, updated uh, values of all of these uh, impacts, but my concern as a nutritionist normally is on nutrients for humans. And uh, if you are aware of the literature, you would know that it's not only B12 that is a, a vitamin that you should supplement. Uh, normally, if you look, look at studies done in vegans, vegetarians, compared to omnivores, B12, uh, B12 is one of them. There's B2, there's B3, B6, DHA, EPA, vitamin D, calcium, iron. All of those are way more available in animal foods than in plants. They, they, may be, they may be more available, but you get what you need. Um, I don't have any vitamin deficiencies as far as yeah, I know. Yeah, you're an anecdote. I'm sorry? I'm talking about, um, you're talking about an anecdote compared to large population studies. And yeah, we know okay, uh, but, the status, sorry, right. almost done. 
right. the status of vegans and vegetarians compared to omnivores in large population studies, and I, I can provide you these references, is not healthy. You are under what is required for humans. You could supplement, but even supplementing is controversial because sometimes you have the opposite effect of what you're supposed wait, to have. Wait, um, but so when you, you take can, B B12, first of all, um, our bodies do manufacture some B12. It's just not, it, it was that we don't all manufacture enough. So we have to supplement. But you may supplement your, your B, you may get your supplemental B12 by eating beef, where the cow is, is, get, you know, is, is developing the B12 by ruminating and, and you know, developing the B12, um, the, you know, the, the, the bacteria from the B12, or you, you, take, a, you take a supplement. Um, but we all get it. We all get it from another source. And the animals are getting it from the same plant sources or similar plant sources from what I get my B12 from, number one. Number two, when you talk about vitamin D, vitamin D is added to milk, okay? I take vitamin D. It comes from a, it comes from a, a lichen source. Um, but I think, you know, in a, lot, a number of the studies that you identified um, are studies that are, are just, um, I think, wrong. And I believe if you look at the weight of evidence, yeah, I know. I mean, you're, you obviously are going to, are, are obvi I understand. I do understand. You are obviously going to focus on whatever person that says, you know, if you eat more than three plants a week, you're going to die. Um, and, you know, just eat more. I understand that. You have an economic interest. But if you look at the, what I would regard as the consensus, the consensus um, uh, uh, information, I think it's absolutely clear. If you look, for example, at Kim Williams, who's the head of the American Cardio Cardiological Association, it's not an animal rights group, and Williams says, if you look at the studies, there are two sorts of cardiologists. There are ones who are vegans and one who, ones who haven't read the literature. I don't, I honestly do not believe that there is any significant literature out there that says that you will not get adequate nutrition if you have a sensible vegan diet. I, I, can, I can provide those. If okay, you fine. Want to fine. I, I understand. And I understand that we, we, you know. Thank you very much. I think we have to stop here okay. at that stage. We will continue later after okay. the coffee break. I release you to the coffee break. Thank you. Thanks, Chris.